Uh, here is James Daly. James was the, I, the founder and the, the guy who created the first white paper of WIFOS a few years ago. I will let you do the math and tell everybody how many years ago. Uh, it was kind of a visionary and, and actually an a, a entrepreneur who decided to, to put that idea on a white paper and let the world enjoy it. What we are now enjoying. So, um, please, uh, I, I, the floor is yours, and he's going to talk about the platforms and how to counterweight them with Finra. I hope. Okay. Thank you, Javier. Um, I, I hope everybody can see my screen. I think it's, it's working. Um, so, yeah. So, this began. This, this journey of mine began. Um, 2001, 2002, when I wrote that paper and we got the project started, um, it, was, it looked a lot different than the world did. And, you know, um, Facebook was, you know, Mark Zuckerberg was still at, at Harvard. Um, Alibaba had been launched, but Alipay was another, you know, two, three years into the future. Um, AWS was a few years into the future. So it was pre-cloud, pre, -cloud, pre um, these big platforms, um, and so it's quite astounding how how in in some respects they've come so far. Um, and I wanted to give a couple of stats. So in 2019, the um, Visa, Union Pay, Mastercard, folks of the world did something around um, close to 300. Um, and well, 380 billion transactions globally. Um, and in China alone, there was 100 billion transactions and the vast majority of those were on the platforms. And so if you look today at where these global platforms, uh, these are Facebook, the Tencent, the uh, Alibaba, Alipay, um, Amazon, where these, where these uh, platforms are today, they're doing effectively the same volume or they're they're at, at just about the volume of credit card companies globally which is just an astounding thing i mean it took the banking sector from you know the 1800s to the mid 1900s to really build up transaction volumes on payments um and and then the credit cards came on and they took from the 1950s to the 1970s 1980s to really get traction and be ubiquitous in, in certain economies. But the platforms, these super platforms have actually gone from zero to, you know, equivalence uh, within, you know, 15 years, let's say, or even less in some cases. So this is an astounding um, development, but it also, you know, I think raises the point that um, they are, they are enough that people do not understand what role they are to play or where they, sh what, role they should play um, in our global um, economy and our in our society. So there's a new term that was uh, coined by Vikas Raj, that these are the super platform companies that are playing this very central role in the financial lives of, of you know, billions of people effectively. Um, and uh, they are doing this, not they're doing payments and they're doing these financial accounts, not because that's what they think is, uh, you know their core business, but they do it because it's it's a required functionality, and they don't treat it as a profit center. This is very different from how the banks or the credit card companies behave. So, can we op can we use open source projects to disrupt the platforms or the platforms? Um, is this the wrong question? Um, of course, uh, I love this little uh, uh, XKCD um, uh, joke here that you know. Um, all modern digital infrastructures really has a, has a lot of open source. So in some sense, the platforms out there are already using open source. And we're, we're part of that story. And the open source movements are part of that story. So it may be the wrong question. I'm trying to sort of get to what I mean by how we coexist, how we um, can work uh, on uh, something that is... Um, 
you know, with them, but also a little bit um, more interesting uh, as an open source um, proposition. So let's let's get to it. So, what advantages do these platforms have? These platforms, so they get massive data, but the more important thing is they have massive data insights. So they process the data, they get the insights. They drive towards lower cost transactions because again, it's not a profit center. They are powered by this commoditized infrastructure, this cloud-based stuff. Um, in economics, we would say that they combine three things. They combine economies of scale because they have you know, millions, then tens of millions, then hundreds of millions, then billions of people. They are powered by economies of scope. They go from, do I need to get across town? Do I need to order groceries? Do I need to get a loan? And the next thing, they just go to the next thing, the next thing, the next thing. You think of Amazon starting in books, and now in everything. Um, economies of demand. These are also known as network effects. So you get, you know, these, these systems have the, the ability to, to create demand on their platform because everybody is there. Uh, so there are a couple of things now that I want to sort of highlight. These are topics that are going to come up in other FINERAC sessions throughout the Apache Con. And so open banking is one of the things that is, in some sense, a counterweight to the platforms. So rather than a single monolithic platform, an ecosystem approach comes about because of open banking. The European Union has been a leader at this. They have uh, something called Payment Systems Directive 1, which really was about the back-end systems, the, the switch systems between the banks, financial institutions. And then PSD2, which is more recent, which concerns the development of an ecosystem of providers that sit on top of the banking services. So these include the account information service providers and the payment initiation pay service providers that are legal entities that are allowed via APIs to connect to the banking systems. This is not actually the reality yet in the United States but the Federal Reserve and others are looking very carefully at how to implement open banking in the United States. The takeaway, the technical takeaway, I think from this is that these API driven architectures could provide uh, an ecosystem of providers and innovators, as long as there is a, a source of good funds. And so we're gonna talk a little bit more into that. So another talk uh, to bring this to sort of reality is, the, the payments hub by Mifos, which sits on top of Finerac um, and wraps it in some sense, has this very important thing, which is the banking channel connectors, which is implementing the WSO2 APIs, which are actually the PSD2 um, uh, payments initiators and uh, account initiators that I talked about in the last slide. So, so the Mifos wrapping of Finerac allows it to do that thing we were just talking about, which is the ecosystem. So this talk is on Thursday, uh, real-time payments, enabling a connected cashless and inclusive society. Um, so I encourage you to listen to that one as well. Um, and then the documentation for this is, is online there at the Git book. Data insights. Now remember, I talked about how these large platforms get data insights. And what I think we want to observe is that Data insights are important, not necessarily the data. Um, IBM, one of the sponsors of this conference, so I'll just do a shout out to them. You know, they're doing some cutting edge research, which um, is about how do you federate data insights via machine learning um, types of, of approaches where you can share the, the output of the model and, uh, and then, you know, use that um, model uh, that's trained to access other data sources and and come up with new insights and then you you create additional um, trained models on top of that and so lots of stuff most of it I can't understand so uh, I encourage folks to go to uh, the session on Thursday um, uh, about AI for all uh, which will get into these you know data science um, things I guess the question that I that I am bringing up is do we really need the ability to combine the data? Um, and, and probably the answer is no. So uh, we can do that uh, without getting all of the uh, data in one place, which means that we can break up in some sense the economies of, of scope, right? We can 
counter the economies of scope by having data insights which allow us to go to new areas uh, without necessarily taking on new and new product lines. Um, so, uh, this is another big, big topic, um, identification. And there are many projects out there that relate to identification. Um, it, it is a, a rabbit hole uh, for me in trying to uh, to delve into this, but I but I do want to function. I do want to point out a few different things. One, um, you know, there's this movement towards uh, self sovereign identity and uh, the sovereign um, foundation, and those folks might actually be here. Um, and the uh, the related work at IBM around Hyperledger and these different working groups that bring together, you know, uh, self sovereign and identity systems and and other types of blockchain kinds of solutions for uh, credentials and and identity systems. Um, and then a, a separate area is uh, the W three C has spent the last you know six seven years getting to a. a a standard now called verifiable credentials. Um, and these can be either blockchain or non-blockchain. They can, they don't have to be a distributed ledger approach. Um, W3C has also just this week released something called distributed ID um, as a working draft. And so those, you know, those things are, are going on. Um, in the world in which, uh, you know, the work that I, I do, um, we're often talking about the difference between functional ID and and foundational ID. And so it's important to sort of understand that, uh, that, that this dichotomy is if you have a voter's card or you have a, a, a school ID or you have a, um, you know, some other ID to get into a building, that's a functional ID. But uh, if you have a, a passport, um, you know, if you have a uh, if you have a social security card, these are foundational IDs that are typically issued by governments, and there are you know roughly 2.7 billion people in the world that lack adequate foundational ID, um, and so it's a huge number of people are excluded. One of the projects that I'll talk about is MoSIP, which is a, an open source um, identity project. Um, I also wanted to bring in something which I find uh, a little bit tangential to identity, but which, which I think has the potential to really shift the um, shift the conversation. And that is looking at the hardware. Like everybody's focused on smartphones. I'm not entirely sure that that's what we're going to see five years from now. Um, and I, I think that biometric payment cards are, are something to keep your eye on. Um, they don't need to connect to a centralized server. They can use the locally stored template for authentication. Um, it, the data is actually stored on the card, making it more secure. And you can use them as well to do contactless interfa interfaces for payments or other transactions. And so the projections are this, this area is going to grow tremendously over the next uh, you know, four years um, as different regions begin to see these cards come out. They can be produced for lower cost than a smartphone, of course, and uh, they may become more ubiquitous as a result of those economics and the functional um, ability that they bring. And then, of course, you can also imagine smartphones operating as biometric payment cards. So I think that's an interesting part of identity and how to achieve inclusive identity is through a hardware angle. Um, just diving a little bit further into the W3C verifiable credentials. Um, you know, the concept is you have proofs, you have claims. Um, the, you, you don't necessarily have to have a trusted uh, domain, but you could have a trusted domain. You could use a kind of um, X509 type of approach uh, with, with these kinds of um, schemes. So, uh, and then the last one is this um, foundational ID concept. This is an active project. They're using it to implement a national ID in Morocco, in Guinea, in the Philippines. Um, they're, they're, they're promoting an open source project to solve a, a very fundamental issue um, globally, which is identity. 
So I think all of these projects are very interesting and, and how they combine it is super important. Um, and mention uh, next thing to talk about would be Mojo Loop. So Mojo Loop, I, I had a, a, a part in articulating some of this architecture early on. And what it does is it creates the switching platform between uh, an account system, so a, a banking system or a wallet system, and it does a real-time push transaction, which is a little different than how the U.S. credit card system works on a, on a pull basis. Uh, it's a fully open source project, um, and you can look it up, mojaloop.io. So at the simplest level, excuse me, we have um, identification as an underlying thing, which is super important. And it, it's a very active field, and I would say it's, it's, it's compli complicated, but um, there are solutions there. And the point is there are many solutions, and so we will see how that goes. There are accounts, um, and Finerac provides that. Um, there are payments. Finerac can connect to these payment systems, and then there are ecosystems of services that can sit on top of that. And then, of course, there's another talk we're gonna, that's going to get into the insights, the data insights that can combine these things. So these are all powered by open source projects, and they can create digital public goods around this concept, which in some sense is my fundamental contention. The platforms came up. They're a necessary innovation. They're a necessary way that we are coming into a new age, but there could be uh, a trajectory where instead of privately held uh, super platforms, we can have public digital goods that that instead provide the same level of functionality but do it um, at, a, at a more publicly oriented uh, way. And I think that that would be a very positive um, evolution. So um, let me also mention why I think that this is that this is possible. So um, the Bank of International Settlements is a, it's a central bank of central banks, if you will. It's, you know, the World Bank, IMF, Bank of International Settlements. It's that entity. And they released in 2018 this, this fascinating exploration of central bank digital currencies, which is really saying to the world, look, central banks could do this thing that, that these other, you know, largely blockchain oriented pr providers are saying that they could do. Um, and they can do it in a way that will provide both wholesale and general purpose payments uh, with, with you know, implications for monetary policy and financial stability. It really suggests a wider role for central banks in the economy, which is to say it's, a, it's an articulation of creating a broader public good um, in banking. And this idea uh, is actually a live conversation in the United States. Um, there's a Stanford social um, uh, SSRN paper that, that you know, was written by several lawyers that really gets into how this could be created. And it doesn't have to be blockchain, of course. It, does, it can be simply using existing centralized types of systems. But the idea is that it would be digital payment accounts that would be federal, um, they'd be Fed accounts, be aimed at the underbanked and unbanked in the United States that have zero fees. And these things are continued to advance in the conversation and at the political level as well. So this idea is not entirely crazy to have a public option or to have a public infrastructure. Um, so what would this look like for a public square financial platform that gets into this more innovative space that these platforms occupy right now? Well, the idea is that you'd have you start off with some sort of ID, a distributed ID, a verifiable credential, et cetera. You'd have some way to connect that to the Apache Finerac platform. You'd have the M, you know, machine learning AI tools that connect to that. You'd have the MIFOS Payments Hub, which connects you to the Mojo Loop switch. You have the MIFOS Payments Connector on top of that. And then that allows for these you know, innovative fintech platforms. So it could look like this. We could have these kinds of public goods provided like this. Um, or we could also have it look like this, which were, would be, you know, you have all of the same things, but they're more vertically oriented. You could have a clean energy provider, FinTech, that uses all of these open source tools, again, connects, 
and with the payment switches, and then you have another innovative fintech or another vertical set of verticals in that space. It, these functionalities then are available, um, you know, nearly available today. The, the gaps that we have right now in our technical stack are actually not that many to achieve this kind of vision. Uh, we're, we're, we're working on this actively, and I think some of the talks later on this week will go into some of those, those topics. Um, so I'm hoping <laughs> that there will be some questions and we can get into a further discussion. Those are my, generally my ideas, um, and I may have spoken too fast. Um, I'm going to stop now and see where we are. Um, so uh, how fast did I talk? <laughs> oh, boy. I took up way too little time on that. Um, very good. Are there any questions over here? I, it, there's no uh, written question. Uh, Javier. Yeah. Oh, your audio is terrible, Javier. At least for me. Is that me? I have a question. No, no, we've got me? some weird audio problem. <laughs> Max Hedrum, for those of you who remember that. Um, excellent. Um, okay. Uh, so, uh, I, what I guess I would love to do is, you know, dive into a few other concepts if any folks have, um, have questions on them. Um, if I could go back to, um, thinking about what the, uh, you know, the big idea here is, um, these, these platforms that do all of these things now in our lives, they're, they're privately held. They are, you know, potentially going to be regulated more and more. Um, and there are some parts of their functionality which are not necessarily, um, they don't necessarily need to be private. And I think if we can get our heads around, you know, banking has been doing, you know, payments, monetary policy from the very beginning of banking. If we can get our heads around that that is a public good, you know, when, when we reach in to our wallets for a, a bill, that's actually a public good. Those that physical cash has been there for, you know, forever, as far as we can tell. But that's actually a, an artifact of, of human civilization. So we we created that concept. We made it into a public good. And so we're now at this point, and, and perhaps an inflection point in these platforms where we can say, look, what you're doing is actually a public good. What you're doing is actually something that we all need and we need to do it at cost, and we need to provide it to everybody. Um, and my contention, I guess, is that we actually have the tools now in Finerac, in Mojo Loop, in these identity systems that, you know, if we're not there right now, we could soon be. And so as a counterweight to these, you know, privately funded, very massive platforms, could we imagine an open source um, approach to this? Um, all right, so I, I, I doubled down on that point. I hope that that was useful for folks. Um, there was a question here about um, these EMV cards. So yeah, there are new, there's a new set of technologies where um, they're thin film um, printed circuits, which have a, a, a battery. Um, they have a, a, a built-in Bluetooth um, capability, and they also have a, a a fingerprint or thumbprint um, reader built onto the card. Um, there are a few providers that are that are working on these things, and uh, this is a new a new way to bring um, security to uh, uh, to a card form feature. and And some of the some of the applications are around security issues, right? So, you, you need a special card which only biometrically verif verifies for you, which then sends a Bluetooth signal to your computer saying that you've been 
even it's like an update to the RSA, you know, timed RSA kind of security code. Um, but it's biometrically verified. You know, you have to be alive. Um, it has to be you, and it, it's it's card it, it's card form feature, um, or form factors. Um, and uh, I, I think that you know this is just one hardware. What I was trying to do in this in this talk is that um, when we think about the future, when we think about the future, we should think about where we've come from. And again, 20 years ago, these platforms didn't exist. Um, and so somebody had to create them. Somebody did create them. And they're now taking over the world in, in, in some very meaningful ways. Uh, and yet, you know, we're not passive members of this conversation. We, we, we can actually have an influence on this by virtue of having some very powerful tools at our, at our disposal. We have cloud technology. It's, it's available and, and uh, it, you know, you can get basically the same computing power that these platforms have because it's cloud. And so we can do that. We have the code that does accounts, that does payments, that does, you know, connection to an ecosystem of providers that could connect to identity. That's a, a gap right now in the FINRAC project, project, I would say, is we don't connect well to identity providers yet. We don't yet have a good way of, of bringing that into the uh, into the system, and we have we have the ability to record tokens, or you know we have some connection to FIDO, FIDO two, I think uh, some you know enhancements are going on there, but in terms of providing that as a service or connecting to a service that can then leverage, but those are some things that we may want to to work on. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, I, I don't know what else. Are there any other questions here? And and Javier, help me out here. Oh, you're still you're still very very. Uh, maybe you could type type into the 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 corner here. Okay, so um, so uh, Giorgio, no, I've I've been going for um, twenty minutes, and I've actually completed my my presentation um, at record speed. Um, I think I got too much caffeine, and I just I spoke too quickly. Um, so, but I will sort of answer some of these questions a little bit more. So the platforms are the Google Alipay um, folks of the world. And how do we compete against them? So, uh, I, I think the building blocks are the technologies, right? So the technologies are there that allow us to do, that allow us to compete um, on each of the three things that I say are are responsible for their success. So the three things that are responsible for their success are economies of scale, right? So they have economies of scale, meaning they can offer their service for a lower and lower cost. The more that they offer the service, right? That's that's the definition of economies of scale. Cloud services, I would argue, allow us to offer services at a lower and lower per unit cost um, over time um, because of the, the nature of you know cloud, and because you're you're getting dispatchable capacity whenever you need it, and the average cost of that continues to fall. So that's economies. Of Second one is economies of scope. Well, I think you can get economies of scope, meaning different products. You know, the idea of you know Uber started in, um, or let's try Amazon. Amazon started in bulk, but then went to household goods, then went to digital, you know, etc. Um, and so adjacencies, and so they have everything on their platform. And uh, if you have a, a approach with um, with the ability to do account lookups and information lookups, then you have the ability to offer all the different kinds of services on one uh, on one thing, even when they're offered by other people. So um, if, you, if you think about how uh, Ali, Alibaba operates, it's fundamentally different than how Amazon works. Amazon works by having everything under one platform and, uh, and you are, you know, your vendors are there. Um, and Alibaba works with, um, you know, a different, you know, a 
merchant marketplace. So it's a little bit closer to eBay than it is to Amazon. And so if you can imagine different business models and you can imagine technology powering an ecosystem of, of providers, so rather than everything on one platform, you're able to have the same number of additional scope um, products, services by connecting these. Uh, and, and the underlying building blocks of that is the ability to, to do account and the ability to do payment. And so if you look at it from that perspective, um, you could have an, a complete ecosystem of, of services that just keep growing and growing and growing and growing and could grow faster than what um, some of these platforms are able to do. So that would be that argument. And then the network effects are basically relying on the same kinds of things. And so, um, and I think there you'd have to have um, you'd have to have smart marketing people to try to say, well, all of this is part of a, you know, this kind of platform. And the reason why I think this is important is that different countries could decide, you know, look, we want we want to have our own Facebook in this country or in this region or on this continent. How could we do that? Well, we could take these open source tools and start to build the fundamentals building blocks of it, and we can start to encourage an ecosystem of providers, and that would provide a counterweight to these big platforms, and it would bring it within that regional or, uh, or country level um, type of approach. Um, if there are no other questions, folks, um, I'm happy to wrap up. Um, I, I did see a little bit um, Okay, I, I think I thank you for your time and your attention. Um, there are a lot of good talks coming up this week. I'm trying to highlight some of them. The uh, just to go through a few of those. Uh, you know, we have uh, open banking, a revolutionary democratizing force for financial service innovation, coming up with Victor Romero, who's going to talk about um, some of what he's been working on in uh, in Mexico. Um, and uh, Ali Hussein Kasim and Matt Miller, um, you know, Ali's from uh, Kenya, I believe, and Matt has been uh, working in the UK uh, with Updraft, so that's a good thing to attend. We have digital field applications coming up uh, at 1235 today, uh, and that's going to be about loan origination and collection, um, and that's um, Avik, with, you know, talking about his uh, fintech company built on top of uh, Interact. So that's the rest of the day. There's quite a few other things on the schedule. Um, I think with that, uh, I will go ahead and um, say thank you and enjoy the rest of the day.